Welcome to your series on cybersecurity tips that everyone should know. I am Amanda Horvath and we have Balaj Nudge with us here. And today we're going to be diving a little bit deeper into another tip that is going to be extremely beneficial for ensuring that you stay secure online because no one wants to get hacked and you might be at risk. So if you haven't watched the previous video, we talked about specifically securing your passwords and diving into what password service to use as well as not repeating passwords and also using very secure passwords from that one password service and how to best practices when creating that one pass code right we also talked about different tips for how to create the pass key that you use for that service and finally we also discussed how to create a master password for the password service that you're using because you want to ensure that stays secure as well so if you want to check that out we will link to it in the description below but in this video we're taking things one step further to continue creating a secure online vault for you in that we are talking about pass keys. Why don't we kick it off with a description of what a pass key is? That's, thank you for asking about that, Amanda, because it's very exciting. It's something of a very new feature. A lot of uh, vendors have talked about password is from the past. We don't want to use passwords anymore. And some larger vendors like Microsoft and Google and others have announced this year that they start supporting password less connections. What does it mean? That's something that Apple has done for a long time. If you have an iPhone, you can basically just look at your iPhone. So it needs to know that you have attention and then it's you, and then it does a facial recognition. Actually, for some of you that may not know, the iPhone doesn't do facial recognition with the camera. They actually have a special secondary radar or camera, however you want to call it, that is specialized for the facial recognition. And that's what uh, does it. This is basically the key for a pass key <laughs> because it, it is something that can only be done by you. Your fingerprint is yours. Your eyes are yours. Your facial uh, features are yours. And so something that identifies you surely is passed on to the website you're logging on at and then basically the website says, oh, I'm talking to Amanda. No problem. I'm going to let her in. And that's the passkey. So this way, you don't need a password anymore to log in your day-to-day. -day. Does it mean yeah. that you don't need to follow the advice that we said last time? It doesn't mean that because you still have a password you can log in with. These websites will still offer you the password login option. If somebody guesses your password is still your password, you're still at risk. But at least you don't have to enter your password as many times. So you're not at risk of maybe somebody eavesdropping or looking at your password, having to dictate, God forbid, dictate your password. You shouldn't share your password with everyone. But there are ways for people to snoop your password if you have to enter it many times. If you're using passkey, that's something that you glance at your phone, you put your fingerprint, things like that. And then that's what lets you in onto the system. Okay. So as we are moving through different, our lives online and going into different websites and stuff, how do we opt for the pass key over the password? Where should we be paying attention to it? How do we recognize it? What are your tips that you have on that? Yeah. So first of all, I recommend vigilance because the login screen is the screen that we hate because it prevents us from getting to the next step. So we're trying to get through it as fast as possible. We just, as soon as we see where to put our username and password, we just put it in or we let this automated password vault fill it out for us. We click next and we're done. And we may have missed that this website now offers pass keys and actually that's a safer way to log in. So watch for your providers, the different websites you're logging in because more and more of them are going to be allowing you to use passkeys. So for example, your Gmail account has rolled out passkeys recently. So you can set up passkeys on your Gmail account. I think all of the Microsoft accounts now also support passkeys. So look at your Outlook account, et cetera, see if you can set up passkeys. Your bank, banks are a little bit slower typically. They are more conservative. They are more for mainstream technologies. 
crypto, your bank, not all your banks will offer pass keys, but watch your bank login page. They will start offering pass keys as well. So just basically a short answer, slow down, don't click quickly, read carefully. And when you see the offer for pass key, that's what it means to allow you to log on with your phone authentication or with your fingerprint or something like that. So let's say Gmail, for example, if we have a Gmail account, which so many people do, when you go to the Gmail homepage and you're about to log in, which a lot of us are already logged in. So let's say we log out in order to log back in, then it would just be underneath the username, password, and then underneath in fine print, it would say, we can now use passkey. Would you like to use it? And it, or how does that show up? Actually, uh, the Gmail example is great because I, I think Google has done a really good job promoting this. So check your mailbox, like your updates. If you have priority mailbox, you may not see it in your priority mailbox, but check your mailbox with Google. They have sent you an email that pass keys are not available. So all you need to do in the case of Google, find that email, click it. You don't need to sign up. You can set up your pass key, make sure it works before you sign out. Because if you sign out and you're like suddenly, hey, I forgot my password, like I don't have it written down somewhere, then now suddenly you, you won't be able to get back in as easily. So I would recommend if you, but if you can't find the email or maybe you just deleted it, you thought it was spam or junk mail, whatever, don't worry about it. You can go to your settings in, in Gmail, your security settings on your Google account, and you can just follow the steps there to set up the passkey. Okay, so why don't we actually walk people through this? So simplifying, so this is what it offers. So I didn't have passkey set up yet here, and it's telling me let's set up passkey. So I don't have to do anything special. It just noticed that I didn't have passkey set up, and I continue. So maybe that's the right approach, that you don't try to do it on your regular browser where you're already signed into Gmail, but open an incognito window, pretend you want to sign in, and it will offer the passkey. And see here, you cannot see, but there's a pop-up that came, a secure pop-up that came that says create passkey for google.com. And then I say continue. And now it's another secure pop-up that you cannot see on my screen, but it pops up to get my fingerprint. So I do my fingerprint and then now you see I'm all set. So the part that you didn't see is the operating system actually validated that it's me through my fingerprint that was already set up in the operating system. So this is a MacBook Pro and the MacBook Pro has a fingerprint reading. Uh, other systems may have facial recognition like on an iPhone or on other systems and it depends what you have. But then this is the pass and now I'm all set and it continues. So- Perfect. Uh, that would be great. Was a, it was a pretty easy step-by-step -step, uh, view of how easy it is to set up your passkey. It didn't take us very long. So you do it once. And now when I log on to this account uh, on Google, on Gmail, it will only ask my fingerprint if I'm on this computer. Now I can set up the passkey also on my phone. And then it will, because my phone uses uh, face recognition, so it will be using the face ID. So to clarify this question, let's say I use Chase Bank and it does say every time that I sign in, it'll use my face ID to, to input my password. But that is different than a pass key because it's actually attaching my face to the password to fill it out. Yes, yeah, so that's that the password vault that you're using that protects your password in the vault with your face ID. Okay. I see. Okay, so that's different. But the bank, unfortunately, you just give your password or maybe you give the bank your security code that you receive over text, okay? I happen to know Chase Bank, Bank of America, US Bank, Wells Fargo, they all work typically with, so a text message for if you wanna set up an additional and more advanced protection. Wells Fargo also allows you to use a key. Like earlier, I showed my key that I can set up. Wells Fargo provides a little authenticator key where you can read the numbers off of it and type it in as a second factor, which makes the password stronger because it's not enough to guess your password. 
now they also need to know that number that's presented on the key. I would say that most foreign banks also offer the key method. I dealt with Peru, with Chile, with Europe, all the European banks offer the key. The key is much stronger than the SMS because the SMS you can actually do what is called a SIM card swapping and people while you're sleeping can clone your SIM card and just by calling the phone company and pretending that they are you. And then by the time you wake up in the morning that all the money you had in your bank account got transferred out. And that happened to many people. I know personally people who lost actually over a million dollars like that. So it's real. <laughs> and, yeah. and you okay. cannot get the money. You cannot claw the money back. Money that's been wired out, the, the traditional wire system is such, you cannot claw it back. If you were made the, making the transfer with Bitcoin, you wouldn't be able to claw it back directly, but at least the FBI can track all the flows because it's an open ledger. But with bank accounts, there is no way to know who, where the money landed that was stolen from your bank account. Wow. So if you don't want to move, lose all the money in your bank account, you got to set up pass keys. That is the conclusion. It would be. Unfortunately, the banks would not let you. So that's the most right. banks don't we let it. Yet. We have to pay attention to those coming out as this is what's coming down the yeah. pipeline. Yeah. So you're better off storing the bigger amounts of money in the couple of things you can do to protect yourself, because I don't want any of the banks that are listening to this to say that I'm scaring away their customers. For example, while at Chase Bank, you can have a text message to validate you and, and somebody could steal with the SIM swapping technique. You could set up a secondary approver for larger transactions where it's not enough to to steal your password and to steal your SIM card, but they would need to, to steal that of an other person that they may not know who that is. So it, it makes it much harder. So when you typically have uh, something of value to protect, uh, it's always a good idea to have a second person's authorization just in the bank vault where you go in, there is your key, and then there's the key of the bank and both keys are needed to open your vault. And, and this, this dual key mechanism is the best. That's also something that out of the box Bitcoin supports. Traditional banks, the protections are not as, as, as sophisticated as with modern technologies. Okay, so from that lens, since we're on this topic, let's share that real quick and how you might be able to do that. And would you recommend, let's say, and now we're getting into nuances here, but would you say that if you have a bank account that you're going to keep the primary, your primary funds within, and maybe it's not the one that you access all the time, but that's where your payments come out of, that's where you're, you're going to keep your major amount of money, then that's probably the one that you want to ensure that you have this double authorization on. Maybe you and your spouse, or if you're not yet married, like you and your mom or your someone else that you trust, I suppose, and someone that would be available whenever you need to log into that account, because you will need them to tell you what that number is whenever you're logging in. Is that what I'm understanding properly? Yeah. Somebody you trust in the moment is maybe the right expression, because all these banks allow you to change the trusted party quickly. So if you don't trust that person anymore, you can quickly change who is the secondary and you can have multiple secondaries. So yes, to your point, you could set up your mom as the secondary, you could set up your sister, brother, etc. And there is little risk with that because they cannot initiate a transaction without your approval anyway. So it's really just that you need to call them to be the approver of a transaction that comes out of your account when you want to initiate it because you set it up you do your part of the approval and you have somebody else approve it and and it's good if it's a person that's not easily guessable from your social media and stuff like that because your brother your sister your parents they're all known but maybe people don't know that you have this friend that you really trust maybe that friend lives in australia and maybe you don't talk very often, but he's okay to be your partner in approving transactions for security and you do the same for him. And because they're honest person, but you don't see each other just every 10 years, 
it still could be a good arrangement because it's a mutually beneficial. You're his backup, he's your backup, it works. You have to really plan ahead if someone is in a, a totally different time zone in terms of whenever you need to make a transfer out of your account. Yeah, if, 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 you, if you have an emergency, you want to make sure you have enough emergency funds. To your point, there is your bank account where you have enough money for day-to-day -day transactions, and there is your bank account where you have the real money that you're trying to protect, where you've been saving for this house down payment, this bigger purchase, a purchase of a car, or whatever. And, and it's actually good to not be able to impulse buy out of your big account where you have your savings, your life savings, right. and to have that protection. So I would say for your day to day, you, yeah, you don't need to do something really complicated, but for your life savings, you probably want to increase the protection. And what is that called? It depends on the bank. Like for example, since we're on Chase Bank, I think they're called it dual control. Dual so control. Make sure so that you dual control with your bank afterwards and it might translate it and give you like how to set it up for your specific bank. Yeah, but just call your banker or go visit them in the banks, the bank branch that you belong to and tell them that you want a secondary approval. And I'm not familiar with all the banking products. I know that on Chase, it seems to be a free feature. We're using it both for business and for personal. It's an easy thing to do. I know that on Bank of America, there's also real good protections. U.S. Bank has good protections, capabilities. Whatever the bank you are, you have, I had good experiences in many banks. So I don't want to, Wells Fargo has also some really good, the Wells Fargo, I would say that the really neat features, they're not offered for the free or the low tier accounts. They're offered more for the business accounts but they have uh, really strong protections for business accounts. So the, the one thing that may change bank to bank is how much they charge for it. I believe that it's in the bank's interest to not have customers that get robbed. So if I can make a plea to bank, you should make this feature free because it's in your interest to reduce fraud. And charging your customers for fraud prevention techniques, I think that's bad business because there's a bunch of banks that do it for free. Maybe one bank that I could recommend that's a European based bank, but they have branches in the US as well. It's uh, WISE. They used to be called TransferWISE. They're very online centric. International transfers are free. Local transfers, US based transfers are very cheap. Like well, most banks charge you $14, they would charge you less than a dollar. I don't mean that as, a, as an ad for TransferWISE or WISE, but it is a really good bank where you can set up these protections and these. They don't charge anything for these multi-layer approvals. Yeah, I've used WISE before to pay Filipinos. <laughs> Does that make sense? Okay, that is super helpful information. I think that's a great wrapping point. So if this video was helpful, please be sure to click drop any questions that have arisen in the comment section below as those will be answered. We would love to engage and get to know you. So thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next version in this video series.